Hi, right, we want to welcome everybody to Facebook Live, the uh, Youth Ministry Edition. And uh, it's so good today to have a close friend of mine uh, with me, uh, former NBA player, Charlotte Hornet, Terry Dozier. Good to have you, Terry. Good to be with you, my friend. Man, I'll tell you what, it's, uh, of course, uh, history, history, history. We, we were just talking about uh, some of the things that uh, we used to do and hang out and uh, there at USC. And uh, it's just a pleasure to know that uh, back then when we were 19, 20, 21, even today at 35, we're still great friends. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> just thinking back when I was in college, um, young, bright eyed, bushy tailed and had no clue what I was doing, but <laughs> had a great appreciation for hooping, mm -hmm. uh, music. And I uh, have to say women. <laughs> well, that, you know, that's what happens in school. That's for yeah, sure. absolutely. Uh, but uh, it, it, uh, it's our pleasure to have you here today. And uh, we want to talk about your transition, about what's happened with you and how you've moved uh, in life and, and uh, from uh, professional sports and to what you are today. And then how, uh, how the gospel was a part of that, how Jesus is a part of that. And so uh, let's talk about your transition from uh, from basketball into what you are today. Give us a, a few words about uh, how that happened and where you are. Well, back in 2001, um, I made a decision to retire from playing basketball because I had two young um, daughters um, who were back in the States when I was still playing ball overseas um, at the point that they could not travel with me. I made a decision that my family was going to be more important than my career at that point and made a decision at the age of uh, 35, I believe I was, um, to retire from playing basketball. And uh, uh, when I came home, I spent two years trying to figure out what, uh, what the next mm -hmm. chapter was going to be, which is very difficult when you spend the majority of your life playing ball. Um, I hadn't yet uh, retired. I mean, I hadn't yet um, finished school uh, when I was playing professional basketball, so I was chipping away at it um, every summer that I had um, while I was playing in Australia, and eventually I got my degree, mm -hmm. which the reason I mentioned that is because it helped me in that transition because with my degree, I was able to go back to the University of South Carolina and get employed at the um, in the athletic department mm -hmm. working with the athletes on career um, development since that was such a challenge for myself. Mm -hmm. So for six years, um, I served as a career development coordinator for the student athletes, finding them careers after their career, mm -hmm. which I found very uh, um, empowering, helping mm -hmm. athletes prepare for life after sport. Um, finding that there were some challenges that majority of the um, African American athletes who were at the school as a special admit because they did not have the funds to pay for the college and academically they were challenged mm -hmm. to go to a university like that. They needed a lot of the support, which we provided. But I found that the, the challenge was that it was already there before they got to the university. Mm -hmm. So I ended up going to you know, being employed at the um, Parks and Recreation mm -hmm. uh, where I was using my philanthropy um, efforts to reach young people in the hood, if you will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so for four years, I served as the family needs coordinator in Parks and Rec, because that's where I got a lot of my support from is the recreation center when I was growing up in the streets of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. So did a lot of mentoring programs there and met the needs of uh, low income families. Found another problem that they were poorly educated and there were a lot of kids getting kicked out of school because of behavior and a lot of other uh, issues. So that's when I ended up um, going into the school system as an administrator and a basketball coach mm -hmm. uh, at the at one of the high schools in, in Columbia, South Carolina. <clears throat> so for six years, I served as an administrator. Mm -hmm. I was a basketball coach for four years, and I was able to work with young people in the school system, um, finding that uh, there were more challenges inside the school system than I could imagine. Uh, especially when it came down to um, behavior issues, um, social issues, and more importantly, um, the need for um, academic and social support. Mm -hmm. And while working with some of the young people who had some real issues with 
their social um, um, aspects of their life, you know, some of the gang violence, um, some of the youth violence that was taking place, kids not caring about their academics. I found that some of the more challenging kids made me need to step up my game a little bit more. Mm. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so mm. Sheriff Lott, um, our, our sheriff here in South Carolina, reached out to me and uh, convinced me to put a uniform on, uh, of which I've been uh, a police officer for the past two years. I'm entering my third year. Mm-hmm. And I, I became a school resource officer before I even knew what a policeman could do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and it, it has really taught me a lot about the, uh, what goes on in the community that creates some of the problems that I've been trying to deal with for so many years since I retired from basketball. Yeah, yeah. And how have you, uh, how have you used uh, basketball and coaching and uh, dealing with, uh, and just dealing with your new job uh, how have you used that in uh, directing lives of young people and dir- directing lives of those that are in uh, secondary education? Well, one, <clears throat> I remember in my growing up, a coach had a great influence on my life uh, mm-hmm. because they gave me an opportunity to play sport, which gave me discipline and structure that I didn't mm-hmm. have coming up in a single parent home. Right. Um, and discovering those abilities and having someone to pull out the best of you I, I value the influence of a coach <clears throat> being able to teach you life skills and discipline and and many of the the intangibles that create a, a well-rounded person. So becoming a coach, I found that it was a lot easier to play the game than actually trying to get someone to yeah. play it the way you did. As, you know, sure. not all the best players make great coaches. No. Uh, uh, you got to be able to uh, – learn how to motivate individuals and they're all just that they're individuals no there's no one size fit all when it comes yeah. down to what motivates uh, different people so saying that i just know that it, it's about establishing relationships with young mm-hmm. people um yeah. and that comes with a, a hefty commitment mm-hmm. beyond the basketball court or the, or the playing field beyond the classroom when you start talking about what brings about uh, some of these issues, it starts at home, it starts in the community, and those things come into your classroom, into the, uh, on your team. So you have to be invested in young mm-hmm. people's lives, build relationships where they gain your trust and you gain theirs. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. It, yeah, it yeah. takes time to uh, get that influence over young people. And you come from a single parent home. Your mom raised how many? My mom raised three kids, but, you know, what people don't understand about my mom, what made it so great is she was a 16-year-old mother of twins. Mm. So she was she had twins at 16 right, back right. in 1966. And then a year later, she had my sister. Mm-hmm. And five years after having my sister, my mom and dad decided that they, it wasn't going to work out. So by the age of five years old, um, we were being raised by a single parent mom in the inner city of Baltimore. And uh, there there were many challenges Mm -hmm. growing up in Baltimore in that single parent home. My mom worked three jobs just to keep the lights on and keep us from getting evicted. And many times she weren't as successful as she would like to be, but Mm -hmm. mom taught me the value of prayer because she Mm -hmm. prayed every night. We didn't go to church, but she prayed every night. Right. Uh, right. And, um, and, you know, just perseverance because she never gave up. She never whined and complained. She just put her head down and kept kept it going. Yeah. And that's what that's what I possess today. And in this belief that anything's possible if you just keep at it. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah. I got that from my mom. And your um, uh, when did you in your in your upbringing when did you understand that you and your brother uh, he has a twin brother Perry Dozier, Perry six eleven, Terry six nine. Uh, that's a whole lot of young people to take care of. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, a whole lot of this. But uh, when, when did your mom, uh, when did she understand that you guys had certain skills and that your growth uh, spurts and your height was uh, was becoming something that uh, coaches and schools and different ones were interested in? Well, we were reared in bowling. Um, my mom was an avid bowler. So we were in a bowling alley. We were thinking we were going to be, 
like a Mark, Mark Roth or Earl Anthony because they were on TV and they were the stars of the day. Yeah. Um, but we did grow like five or six inches over uh, the summer in our, the, our between our eighth and our ninth grade year. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, my cousin, my late cousin, Reggie Lewis, who was the captain of the Boston Celtics, mm-hmm. um, he convinced us to go and play for an AAU team in Baltimore. And um, my mom, to get us away from the um, gang-infested neighborhood, we ended up moving to the county in uh, Maryland, out in Columbia, Maryland, where we went to high school for the first three years in Howard County. Mm-hmm. And that's where we started to dawn our skills and got the attention being very tall and playing basketball. We weren't as good mm-hmm. until mm-hmm. we got where we started playing more AAU. Mm-hmm. And my cousin, again, the influence of my cousin, convinced us to move back to Baltimore, where we started attending Dunbar High School. Right. One of the most prestigious high schools. So anyway, to answer your question, my mom, she really knew that we were just staying active. But in terms of how good we were, she didn't really understand that until we started winning state championships and Mm -hmm. national championships that she knew we were doing something special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, okay, and so you played at Dunbar, which was one of the premier uh, high school basketball schools across America. And uh, name some of the players that come out of Dunbar. Reggie Lewis, Reggie Williams, Tyrone Muggsy Bogues, David Wingate, Sam Cassell. Uh Uh, That's just to name a few. I mean, there were some guys that their names didn't make it that big, but we had 15 man um, roster Uh and all 15 guys were getting D1 scholarships. Wow. Uh, Those college coaches would come to our practice. They said um, in it for the 1982-83 team that that went undefeated, they actually went undefeated 28-0 and 31-0 in two years. Mm-hmm. And they said the number one team was at Dunbar High School, mm-hmm. and the number two team was Dunbar High School's second team. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was, that's how good the teams were. Yeah. I, well, I know I know when uh, you guys were out Oak Hill was they were rising up at the time. And uh, even when I lived in Hawaii, um, they brought the best high school teams into Hawaii and they played and Dunbar was one of them and Oak Hill was there. And uh, uh, and then we have in the Church God of Prophecy, we have one of the premier high school teams today, which is uh, Cree Hills uh, Christian Academy mm-hmm. uh, with a few players that uh, certainly have signed to D1 and then a, uh, two or three that have gone on to the NBA. Mm-hmm. And uh, let me ask you this, uh, w- with your new job, being an SRO and then now being on patrol, okay, because of COVID-19. Um, talk to me about how you've seen COVID-19 affect, uh, affect uh, humanity. Well, obviously with the stay at home ordinances and, uh, you know, social distancing, many people are having to stay home and be around each other a lot more, uh, which, you know, it started creating some problems at home. Uh, domestic uh, violence and and civil disturbances are way up uh, because people are now having to deal with one another and can't have no way of an escape. Mm-hmm. Um, and so a lot of our calls for services are in that area um, mm-hmm. of domestic violence. Is, um, it it kind of reminds you of the scripture where they say there's going to be a time where mothers will be against daughters and daughters mm-hmm. against mothers and children are going to be rebelling. Mm-hmm. Trust me, we're living those days. It's happening. <laughs> it's happening. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and also, I found that it was an alarming number of men depending on women, mm-hmm. which is definitely different from my days of growing up. Sure, sure. Uh, where when you're having to go deal with a domestic dispute and we have to separate someone, it's usually the men that have to leave because the um, lease or the mortgage is in the woman's name. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're finding that there's been an invert of what God originally created men to be leaders in the home. Mm-hmm. They're now just um, leeching and hanging off whatever women do. So mm-hmm. that's one of those things. And then you got children who are rebellious and the parents are having to deal with them when they used to send them off to school. They're now having to deal with them 24 mm-hmm. seven and kids are being influenced by the, by getting there, you know, mm-hmm. speaking at their parents like they're their children. So, yes, we, we've had an a, a increase in domestic violence, civil disturbances in, in regard that people are trying to survive. There are a lot of people 
or furloughed or off or laid off or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to survive and they're going in and they're shopliftings up. Um, people are having arguments with people in uh, places of service because of, you know, the, the crowds and, you know, the, uh, a lot of the dis discipline that come along with this has been challenging people who don't have discipline and mm -hmm. don't have good conflict resolution skills. Mm -hmm. And children being home all day, you know, a lot of the kids are now doing promiscuous things and they're roaming about mm -hmm. um, violating people's property by breaking into cars, stealing cars, um, mm -hmm. and breaking into homes. So we got a lot of that going on as well. Uh, uh, and so in all of this, as you go out and deal with uh, the mindset and uh, uh, the things that are happening because of COVID-19, the uh, isolation, uh, the quarantine, uh, how have you uh, dealt with this spiritually? Have you had opportunities to uh, share God's love, share God's heart as you go out and, and uh, interact with people? Yeah, well, in, in a number of ways, I'm glad you asked that. One, um, here in Richland County, Sheriff Lott does not want his deputies responding to calls with masks on their face. Mm. So whereas there's so much been, and we know that uh, the, the experts say the best way to deal with this and c control it is to wear masks and clean hands and everything. Well, we are not allowed to do so. Mm -hmm. So one thing wow. I do, I know I've got my trust in the Lord that he's going to protect me. The full mm -hmm. arm of God has to be on me because I cannot protect myself in any other way. Right. Um, the other is, you know, using the wisdom of God to solve a lot of the conflicts that we're having to face, mm. you know, because there's going to be two wrongs going on and we have to use um, the wisdom of God to solve problems that are emotionally driven. Sure. The other thing is um, when you start looking at the word has prepared us for this time. Mm -hmm. um, it said that there are going to be times perilous times where people are no longer going to tolerate the truth. Mm -hmm. They're going to be listening what the inching ear wants to hear. Um, churches have been um, not meeting uh, the traditional way. Mm -hmm. So you come in there, you start preaching, you're going to hear something back that you're not going to be want to live to. Yeah. However, what the example that Jesus gave us, even while he was hanging out on the cross, mm. He said, mm -hmm. forgive them for they know not what they do. Right. Um, you show compassion on people when you understand that they're under stress and they're under all kinds of things that are going on. So you are that representation of Christ when you show up mm -hmm. in authority, with right. authority. Right. And you speak life into a situation, not death. Mm -hmm. So um, it has helped me to keep a calm head in the midst of a storm. Mm -hmm. You know, because yeah. other people are panicking when the word tells us in a crisis, we need to keep our head, our mm -hmm. composure. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I've been. I've been exercising my faith in the midst of a storm. There's been calm and peace mm -hmm. um, in how I deal with it. Amen. And uh, you, were, you were telling me an example. I asked you uh, last night uh, about. Um, uh, any protesting, anything like that going on. And you mentioned an incident uh, at a church. You want to share that uh, sure. with everybody? Yeah, as we're starting to transition out of this stay at home ordinance and everything, uh, but churches have been finding creative ways like we're doing here, but also they've been meeting outdoors mm -hmm. um, instead of in a confined uh, building. So they've been meeting outdoors and we had a situation where we got called for a, a civil disturbance, um, a noise ordinance that someone was complaining that there was too much noise being made by this church during their worship time. Mm -hmm. So when we got there, the complainant uh, pointed out and we had to inform him that uh, these people are worshiping and there's no law against worshiping. Mm -hmm. So we had to allow them to worship their God. Sure. And uh, the gentleman then said, OK, well, if that's the case, I'm going to pull out my guitar because I played in a band mm -hmm. and I'm going to play my music. And then we told him, then we're going to come here and we got to deal with you for disturbing the peace and, <laughs> and, and, and the noise 
complaint. He said, well, what's the difference? He said, theirs is worship, yours isn't. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to let them know that uh, the church is protected um, by law. Isn't that to, something? To worship, yes. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, it's amazing the, the places that, uh, you know, regardless of our stories, regardless of our upbringing, um, what our lives have uh None of us expected this time that we're in. Um, and, you know, it, it's, uh, it's amazing how that uh, our spirituality, of course, I'm in ministry. You're in ministry, too, even though you're a sheriff's deputy uh, and you've been in ministry for uh, quite a few years. Um, when did you um, tell us a story real quick about uh, your, your, your coming to Christ? Uh, I, believe, I believe you were in Australia at the time. Absolutely. I was playing professional basketball. I'm, I'm in my second year because um, I played my first year in, in, in Charlotte. My second year, I went to Australia. I was in uh, Geelong, Victoria, playing for the Supercats <clears throat> and uh, still having this desire to go out and club, you know, mm -hmm. did what I was doing because I was mm -hmm. unsaved. And uh, my teammate, they, they always had two Americans on, on, on each team and my other American. Um, teammate was uh, Everett Stevens from uh, Indiana, mm -hmm. played at Purdue. He also played uh, with the Milwaukee Bucks and a couple of other teams. But anyway, he was my teammate. And so on the road, we would room together in mm -hmm. the hotels. So what we would do is I would go and get myself ready to go to the club, mm -hmm. uh, you know, check the ladies out mm -hmm. and he wouldn't go. And I try, you know, misery likes company. So I was like, hey, come on, let's go out. And he's like, no, nah, I don't want to go. And I said, why not? He said he was married. I said, me too. He said he had children. I said, me too. He said he don't drink. I said, me either. Mm -hmm. And then he said something that I couldn't match with. He said, well, I'm saved. And it was mm -hmm. like crickets. I couldn't say nothing. So I still right. went out and uh, I would come back smelling like smoke, even though I didn't smoke or drink. Because, you know, in that environment, whatever environment you're in, you're going to consume it in your clothes and your your, your on your body, mm -hmm. yeah, but he was sleeping soundly, and we would go play ball the next day. Um, mm -hmm. I was drained and <laughs> from partying, and he was energized from worshiping <laughs> God. Eventually, I got curious and I uh, asked him about his faith, and he shared with me. He said, "Hey, Terry, you're a good guy. It doesn't take much, man. You know, it's about being righteous." He said, "You don't, you don't have much to do to." be what God wants you to be. You are already a good guy. Yeah. And so when he made it possible for me to be able to get right with God, because before I was thinking, man, ain't no way God going to accept this guy, you know, but um, yeah, yeah. yeah, but eventually um, I, I was able to um, get to a place where I wanted it. Yeah. I wanted what he had, that peace that he had and sure. that confidence in himself. And all I can tell you is when I tried to go out one more time um, to do what I shouldn't have been doing, being a married man, um, my wife looked me in the eyes and asked me with tears in her eyes, why am I doing this to her? And all I could see was what my father was doing to my mm. my mom. And yeah, I vowed yeah. I would not be like my father. Yeah. Um, it was a moment in my life where I knew, regardless of how much money I was making, how famous I was or how successful I was in my athletic career. Yeah. There was a void that needed to be filled and that witness of Everett and those who came before him gave me the avenue to um humble myself and accept Christ mm -hmm. in my life. And it's been a twenty nine year journey that I can say has been the best thing, uh, best decision I've ever made in my life. Amen. You know, it, it's uh, and I think I, I don't know how soon it was after you accepted Christ that you called me mm -hmm. and uh, let me know that you were saved. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when you and I, when we were at USC together, we we might have went out a couple times, you know, maybe to the club, mm -hmm. did what we do, you know. <laughs> but uh, I was telling you a while ago that uh, I in my spirit, I felt so sorry because at that time uh, I didn't drink or smoke either, mm -hmm. but you know, I would go to a club and of course, you know, girls and that kind of thing. But um, I was never a witness for Jesus. And so I remember you calling me and telling me that you were saved and immediately on me was this uh, weight of guilt. Mm -hmm. And if I remember right, I apologized to you on the phone that night. Say, man, I'm so sorry. You know, I knew Jesus. 
I had a relationship with him. I wasn't always strong. I was weak sometimes, but I never was a witness to you. You, you knew I was a guy who didn't do certain things, mm -hmm. but uh, I was never the witness for Jesus that I should have been. And so that's why I'm saying to young people out there today, God has a, a will for your life. If you know him, if you love him, uh, God's will for you is that you bring others into a relationship with him. Uh, and, and, you know, you're looking at a friendship that's uh, over 30 years. 30 years. Yeah. Or 33, and actually. 30, 33 years. Yes. And, uh, you know, I had opportunities many times to share Jesus with with you, your brother, uh, all the athletes at uh, USC uh, that I knew and that, you know, we were uh, we would play with. And um, I, I was telling you of a, a story last night. I was uh, helping uh, Alex English, which uh, he was one of the top 50 players uh, at one time. He was touted as one of the top 50 players. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was helping him practice one day and. You know, just shagging balls for him and throwing them back to him. He was, you know, shooting his jumpers and doing his uh, uh, free throws. And we sat down together and, you know, he said, you know, what's your greatest dream? What do you want to be? And I said, well, you know, I'd like to be like you. I'd like to be an NBA player. And I said, well, let me ask you. I said, what would you like to be? He said, I'd like to be a pastor. Which for me, once again, you know, I, I felt a weight of guilt because I wasn't portraying Christ like I should have been. And, um, you know, as we've gone through the years and once again, uh, uh, Jesus has made a difference in our life. We're now in ministry. You're in a ministry that it goes beyond the, the pew, beyond the pulpit. You're out there touching people every day. And uh, I just thank God for uh, your life. I thank, you, I thank God for your witness. And I thank God for your friendship. And... Uh, I want you to know, uh, and, and before we go and before we finish today, I want to thank everybody for being with us today, hanging out with us. There was a little show that just finished up 10 episodes called The Last Dance. We, talk, we talked about this last night till, man, we talked for an hour mm -hmm. about what we saw in uh, Michael Jordan mm -hmm. uh, and, and the intensity that he played with, the intensity that he uh, uh, led with. And uh, uh, I was thinking last night, should we not have some some of that intensity and fervor about sharing the gospel and leading in this world that needs Jesus? What what do you got to say about that? Oh, I, I you know it's funny we talked about it last night. I didn't have anything to at that moment to refer to, but as you were talking, God took me to Paul. Mm -hmm. Paul had that fervor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You no, know, he 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 would. When he was persecuting the church, he did it the way Michael Jordan did it. Yeah. He was going to be the best at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His reputation preceded him to the point that when he had his conversion on the road to Damascus and he was witnessing for Jesus, they thought it was a trap. Yeah, yeah. His reputation, it made it challenging for him to witness because of his reputation. Yeah. However, that same fervor that he had to persecute the church, Lord, the Lord changed it. Mm -hmm. Not change the fervor, but what he was doing it for. Yeah, yeah. Actually, he was committed what he believed to be a religious effort. Mm -hmm. He was doing it for religious reasons, yeah. but it was perverted. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to share this. And I'm glad you brought that up. What I couldn't think of it last night when we were talking about it, but that's what made me admire what Jordan did mm -hmm. because he did something that others weren't willing to do to be that great. Mm -hmm. There were other people that are great, but for him to be the greatest, yeah, yeah. the GOAT, mm -hmm. it took his mentality. Paul's mentality is what made him the greatest writer of the New Testament mm -hmm. because people didn't like his word either. Mm -hmm. They stoned him. They put him in jail. Mm -hmm. They left him for dead. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he got his strength back, he got up preaching the gospel some more. <laughs> so yeah. I think that's the best comparison when it comes down to the spiritual part of it. You have to be willing to get out of your comfort zone and be scandalized and frowned upon and not be popular in, in regard to the itching ear mm -hmm. to bring about what Jesus said. We will suffer his mm -hmm. baptism. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah, yeah. We're going to struggle in this effort to bring the good news to a lost world. 
But there's no other way I want to be able to do what I'm doing now than for Jesus because I've tried the other way mm -hmm. and it just don't meet the needs because God put out desire for him on our heart. Yeah, sure. So sure. that conversion of my heart has been what has dri driven me. And yes, we will suffer mm -hmm. for the kingdom, but uh, I don't mm -hmm. think of anything better to suffer for than the love of Jesus. Yeah, Paul said, you know, I have reason to boast. Yep. And then he gave all the things that he could boast about. He said, but I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. Yes, he did. And, uh, you know, he said uh, there was a thorn put in my flesh that buffeted me. Yes. I prayed Keep three on. times that it be removed. But God my said, grace. my grace. My it's, grace is sufficient. It's sufficient for you. Glory you know, God. my strength is made perfect because you're weak. Yes. Not because you're strong. No. But because you're weak. Yes. And for us to to find that place mm. where it's not about us, mm. but it's about him in us mm. doing what he wills in us mm. and uh, will cause us to, once again, to love us with all, you know, to love him with all our heart. And it causes us to do his will in the earth. And that is to bring others to know Jesus. Yeah. You know, that was something else. Uh, again, we didn't talk about it last night, but I thought as you were talking that what stood out to me about Jordan's, um, I guess account or recollection of his career. Mm -hmm. You can sense there was an emptiness in him. Um, that yeah, he lost his dad, and um, you know there was people talking about his gambling, and mm -hmm. you know he couldn't have his freedom. We talk mm -hmm. about freedom being set free. Yeah. So he was in prison, mm -hmm. couldn't even go out like normal people can. But what what stood out for me as you were talking is that. There was no acknowledgement of God in all this. Nope. And you can see that no matter how much money he's made, how successful he's been, the most iconic person in the world when it comes to sports. Mm -hmm. Yet you can sense there was an emptiness there. Yeah. And all I could think was of all the people he encountered, as you were talking about, <laughs> you know, you did not witness. I want to say this to you, Kirk, and I, I didn't say it to you the other day, but I want to make sure I, I, I want to be remiss to say this about you. You were talking about how you did not witness, and I beg to differ. Mm. And the reason I say I beg to differ, and I don't want to, um, you know, lighten anything that you're saying in terms of what we got to do as Christians, witnesses to the world, but Paul did say, I became all things to all men. Mm that I might win them over. You know, he said that, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When he was in Rome, he had to function as the Romans. When he was a Jew, he had to be a Jew. You know what I mean? He talked about, he had to blend in. Mm -hmm. Jesus had to go into Matthew's house. Mm -hmm. You know, he had to do a lot of things that went against the grain. Sure. That people might be saved. Mm -hmm. So I want to tell you, all things, work together work for the together. good of those who love the Lord who are called according to his purpose had you not been where you were at the time and going being a club brother I don't know if I'm where I'm at today <laughs> um so so we we do not count it as robbery that in your state that you were in do not look back on that time, like it was a negative man. It was not negative at all because of where we are today. Mm -hmm. And so I want to say this to you. We won't, like, for instance, let me say this last thing. Jesus did not say, okay, let me run into the wilderness to be te tempted. But he was there. And according to the Bible, the Bible said he was led. Mm -hmm. yes. I believe you were led mm -hmm. to be there for me, brother. <laughs> I'm telling you. I appreciate so, that, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying, man. Because if it was not so, we wouldn't yeah. be here today talking about Jesus and this relationship we got. So I want to at least let you know, man, you were purposed to be there for this guy to have the effect on people you never come across. So your influence in my life has been an influence on other people's lives. Well, I appreciate that. appreciate those kind words. And uh, we just want to say to everybody out there that... Uh, we pray that uh, God's will be done in your life, that uh, you decide during this time of COVID-19 to find new ways to touch those that are around you, to share the love of God, to share Jesus with the world 
and the gift of eternal life. And uh, uh, if you want to know all things uh, youth ministry, go to yminternational.org. For all things youth training, go to ymcertification.org. Uh, it's been my great pleasure to have my friend Terry Dozier with us today. And uh, Terry, we love you, man. Love you too, brother. And uh, um, I, I'm going to tell you, I, I can't wait till all this stuff is is done and over with that when you have that uh, that that conference again, you know, that when everybody comes from all over the world together, man, I'll tell you, I've been twice and it was twice as nice and I can't wait till the third time because that is awesome to wow. come together with all of God's people from all over the world in the Church of God of Prophecy. So prayerfully, um, um, sometime soon, we'll get to experience that once again. And, it, and it, I want everybody out there that's watching to know that it is a truth that anytime I want to post him up, I can. OK, just so you know, like today, I'm, I'm taller than he is. Everybody sees that, right? OK, just make sure you know. Well, that's why you sat me down like this. I said, hey, scoot down just a little bit. man. Yeah. So uh, anyway, we, we do love you, man. Tell the wife we love her and the family and uh, Perry, Perry Jr. Uh, yeah. We just love you all. And uh, we just pray that God bless you. And thank you for being with us today and uh, blessings to all. See you.